It looks like we are live on Facebook. We are live in Zoom. Thank you to everyone for joining today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to be covering the real estate trends that you really need to pay attention to in 2021. And as, um, as I do on a normal basis, on a yearly basis, I, I like to keep up with the trends and I read the Swanepoel Trends Report um, put out by T360 every year. And it is... All right, Craig said he's going to be watching chat over on Facebook. I'm going to be doing my best um, watching chat both here on Zoom and on Facebook as well. It's tough to watch it in both places. But if you do have questions as we go, let me know uh, in one of the chats here, and I will do my best to answer any questions um, as we go. So definitely throw those in there, and thank you again for joining today. All right, so... Um, we're going to talk today about the trends that you need to pay attention to. And as I normally do, uh, I read the trends report every year. I have for a decade now, and I've paid close attention and talked to a lot of agents throughout the year um, to figure out what the trends are, what we need to pay attention to, and sort of what directions to go. So I hope to bring some of that information to you today, uh, hopefully some ideas that you can take away, and uh, you know what, what you can do to adjust your sales before the wind changes entirely. Now, for those that don't know me, my name is Alex Camilio. I'm the CEO of the Agent Inner Circle. Uh, I've been in the real estate industry for over 10 years at that point. Over that time, I've helped more than 15,000 agents. Now, the group I currently manage is a group called the Agent Inner Circle, and this is a community of uh, close to 30,000 agents all over the globe that help each other um, with their businesses, to grow in their businesses and their lives. It is a totally free blog uh, every week. You don't even have to give us your email to check out any of the content. It's totally open, uh, and it is dedicated to helping you improve your business. Now, the only difference between us and some of the other folks out there is we like to give away templates, uh, things you can use, worksheets, um, something you can actually go use that day, and again, totally free. So, Definitely check out agentinnercircle.com or the Agent Inner Circle group uh, if you haven't already. So now let's dive in today and talk about some of these trends that I've seen come about um, between you know a lot of different agents uh, and brokerages. Now one thing to keep in mind here is that the Swanepoel report and where a lot of the information um, is coming from today is aimed mostly at brokerages. So the the um, the pitch or the angle or the view of the information and how it's broken down tends to be focused around brokerages. And for what they do, that's really fantastic. But I tend to focus more in the agent side of the world and what every individual agent can do to improve their own business. So I'm going to try to bring these topics to you and break them down and talk about them in a way where it's for every agent out there. And it's not necessarily what the brokerage can do to get ahead from this info, um, but what each individual person can do. Now, there are four trends that really stood out. There's five we're going to cover, but there are four that really stood out as trends that we're going to talk about today and that I think make a really big impact and will make a big impact for the coming year um, within the real estate industry. Now, the first one is housing affordability. And it's interesting because what you hear a lot of people talking about today is the topic of a listing shortage, that many markets out there right now are in a listing shortage. But I'm going to break down how a lot of that actually has to do with housing affordability and not necessarily just a listing shortage. The next thing is we're going to talk about franchising, EXP, and Realogy, and what the state of franchises currently are, because I see a lot of agents um, currently moving to some of the non-standard models when it comes to um, some of the franchise models, and we're just going to talk about that a little bit more in-depth in trends. The next one is a really, really interesting one. I'm excited for this today, but it is the lead generation model. We'll talk all in depth about how brokerages um, are basically charging agents for leads, but I, I don't want to spoil it yet. Uh, and then last but not least, we'll call it the post-pandemic new normal. And this is what um, the Swanepoel book called it, but we're going to talk today about what are some of the things that are going to stick around um, after everybody had to adapt and change this year a little bit. And then what are some of the things that uh, might not stick around to such a large extent. So does this sound good to everybody? 
Um, if you have questions, let me know as we go along. I'm excited for this topic today. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see um, some of the questions as we go, because I'm sure these trends topics always bring up some really great questions uh, and some really great comments from everybody. So feel free to, to jump in and, and add those in our chat. Now, as I mentioned, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the housing affordability reality. And, you know, we've talked, we said, okay, we know there are listing shortages in a lot of areas and a lot of places all over North America. Um, there are crazy listing shortages, bidding wars like crazy, sellers market like crazy, prices keep going up, people keep offering above, you know, asking price, um, and all those sorts of things. And there are those bidding wars out there. But I want you to keep in mind that a lot of this has been fueled in recent years by a housing affordability, and I don't want to call it crisis, but we definitely need to pay attention to this before it gets any more um, out of control or uh, you know further down the line. Now, when I talk about housing affordability, I'm talking about um, different sort of groups, different demographics being able to afford houses at different price points. And there have been a lot of factors that have played into that uh, over the years. So first, we're, we'll talk a little bit about housing inventory because it's low right now and there's a general lack of supply. But the lack of supply is not just because sellers are not putting their home in the market. The lack of supply comes from a number of different things. First of all, demand in general has gone up in recent years. There are more people um, in the market trying to get homes at this point than there were in years past. So some of this is that the building um, and some of the growth has not kept up with the amount of demand that has been, um, has been out there in the market. But the tough part is that this building growth not only didn't keep up with the market across the board, it specifically didn't keep up with the market of low, uh, lower to middle income um, families that are trying to get into homes. There were a lot more um, uh, higher income homes that were built. There were a lot of different costs. Now that we can go into why that was, uh, everything from you know um, some fallout from 0809, where banks and builders were not. Uh, we're not ready to go, you know, fe feeling worried that they were going to overpopulate and overbuild as we've seen in years past. They were reluctant to do that. Labor costs have gone up in general um, and some labor shortages have caused some of those costs to go up. So not just building material costs, but labor costs in general because um, some of the vocational trades are not as popular right now. So those costs have gone up. Now, you put that on top of some other local regulations and some things going on. We realize that this housing inventory and this shortage is coming about because we're not focused necessarily on building the right types of homes for the demand that's out there. So we've got to tackle this somehow. We've got to look at this somehow. And it's the problem is not, and the reason I want to bring this trend and this topic to you is that the problem is not just in, hey, sellers need to, we need to get more people to put their houses on the market. Um, this is something that has been building for a long time now um, that has, you know, really come to a head this year, but um, is not something that, we, you know, was totally unexpected or that we couldn't see coming at all. Now, you can add some things on top of this that have really uh, sort of added to the problem or expanded this problem a little bit. So home prices keep going up, a lot of which is because inventory is so low, demand is so high, that's a natural progression. But not just home prices uh, in terms of right now as we're talking about them, but the average home price over time has started going up, making it uh, because there are so many fewer houses in that lower income bracket. So as a percentage of the rest of the industry, that has started going up as well. Um, and it's certainly something I think we want to combat or think about or so on. Now, the next thing is mortgage rates. Um, those are at an all-time low, or not all-time, but pretty much all-time low. Um, and the lowest we've seen in years and years and years uh, in these last few months. So that is continuing to fuel that really high buyer demand. Um, even though the inventory isn't necessarily there 
Uh, and last but not least, there's some investor impact in what's going on right now. Um, some of the homes that uh, have been bought up by larger investor sets have been transitioned into either um, rental properties or other types of properties that are not satisfying the demand of the demand that's actually out there. So we're kind of misallocated in terms of the homes that we see out there. Now, this gives you a few um, opportunities, but it's definitely something to pay attention to because this impacts a whole bunch of different uh, markets. So first, obviously, this, this impacts first-time buyers. Um, we are seeing a lot of people that are getting buyer fatigue over a period in time where they're, you know, not staying. They, they put in a bunch of offers on a home and they say, God, 30 offers later, I don't have a place. I'm just going to back out and I'm left with a really poor taste in my mouth. So you definitely want to make sure that you are preparing any buyers that are coming in this year for what they're up against. Um, Try to be realistic with people. You know, I, I know we want to be optimistic about, oh, we're going to get you into a home, but be realistic with people about the journey that it might take for them uh, to be able to get into that home because it can be a little bit of an arduous one at this point in terms of some of the first time home buyers out there. You also might want to mention to them that this is not necessarily, this is the reality right now but this is not necessarily the reality at all times um, in the market that, um, you know, this happens to be this stage of the market, you know, what the benefits or costs are of um, purchasing in this market and, and how they might want to go about what they're purchasing in a home. Because at the end of the day, you are that consultant, right? You're, you're guiding them and making the best decision uh, for their money and their life in terms of what home they're purchasing. So be that consultant and guide them as best you can. The next thing to pay attention to is lower income buyers and, and then renters. Um, even rent itself has gone up to a point where it is becoming increasingly difficult to rent a place. Now that is an opportunity, but that's also a challenge. So the opportunity there is as rent continues to go up, um, comparatively to what people are getting that increases a pain point of people saying, gosh, I want to get out of this rent because it's just getting worse and worse. It's harder to find and I'm not getting uh, the value out of my money. Um, it, that, that value proposition is just getting worse and worse for people. But keep in mind that the, the other problem here is the lower income buyers. And I think we want to all keep in mind that this isn't necessarily going to happen um, overnight or uh, is not something we're going to necessarily fix today. And I want to mention this because it's, it's something where, and I'll say it right here in, as I do in the text, our current inventory challenges are particularly bad for first time and lower income buyers. We must work as a community to solve these housing affordability issues in the long term. So when you're looking at newer developments or when you're talking with builders or when you're working with different people in the community, pay attention to not just, oh my God, we don't have homes, we need to build homes, or oh my God, we don't have homes, we need to get homes on the market. Pay attention to what the community is looking for in terms of types of homes because continuing to flood a market um, with properties that are not necessarily, uh, obviously people need to sell their home, they need to sell their home, but pay attention to the folks that you might want to be marketing to the folks that are going to have the easiest purchase of a home. Um, or even if you're looking into building homes or regulations in your area or getting involved politically or things like that, you need to pay attention to satisfying all different sides across the market, um, to really fix this inventory challenge that we're all facing right now. All right. So does that make sense for everybody? Um, any other thoughts or comments or questions or anything on that first trend, please feel free to put them in chat. Um, I am I'm all ears. and I love to, to converse about this further with everybody. And uh, if not, I'll go right into our next trend here. Okay. All right. So the next trend is franchising EXP and Realogy. So with there, this actually was three different chapters um, within the Swanepoel report. 
I really condensed it down into a single chapter because I think these are all sort of forces that are, I don't want to say playing against each other, but they're different factions all playing within the same game. And what I mean by that is there are um, publicly traded franchises, there are privately held franchises, uh, and then there are independent brokerages. Within the private and publicly held, they all do similar but different things to support agents, whether it be from a legal standpoint, a technology standpoint, a mentoring standpoint. There are all sorts of different aspects that groups fall into within these um, franchising models to be able to support agents. Now, one thing we've seen consistently within this is a growth of what are being called mega brokerages. Um, for example, EXP, and we'll get to that in a minute here, but they are 32,000 agents as a brokerage. And there are a number of others out there that are, uh, you know, really huge, huge brokerages that we need to pay attention to. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of the interrelationship and the play across all of them. Now, these brokerages and these franchises um, all sort of break down into a few different models. So the first franchise and the one um, that, that, you know, that most of us know and, and across the board is uh, Realogy Group or a number of the other similar large franchises, Remax, Keller Williams, so on. Those all sort of fit into a model of charging an upfront free to, fee to start your brokerage a uh, 6% um, GCI commission uh, for various management, and then some other fees when it comes to technology or support stack or, or those sorts of things. Now, I will say uh, that the Swanepoel Report does a fantastic job of breaking that down. Um, they did a huge survey. There's some great information in there that really in detail breaks down the competition and what all of them offer and those sorts of things. So if you're interested in more details in that, I would definitely uh, check out the Swanepoel report for that, um, for that aspect. But what you start realizing is that some of these groups that are um, standing out or, uh, you know, gaining market share and competing as some of these trends are changing are changing up this standard model a little bit. So the first one I want to talk about is EXP um, because EXP just continues to expand. Uh, just, I mean, they are, they are blowing up in the last um, 12 years. They're up to 32,000 agents and the fourth largest uh, brokerage by sales volume. I mean, that's wild to do with, you know, with 12 years. And we're talking about some of these other franchises who have been around close to 100 years. Um, franchise 30 ago. I mean, franchises really hit the scene in the early 70s. So uh, for somebody to come in and compete with folks that have been doing it since the early 70s um, is definitely a task. Now, early on, a lot of people wanted to focus on, oh, the technology. And uh, for those of us that have been in the tech world and so on, we know that all the franchises, everybody out there offers a different set of tech. The real differentiator that EXP has, um, has set up for themselves is that they are uh, changing how the commission sharing and cap model works. Um, so they are... Uh, and again, if you want to get into the detailed breakdown of how they do it, I'm sure there are people who will talk to you from there, or you can check it out in the report itself. But I just want to cover some of the main overall concepts because I think these have been inviting enough to enough agents that we want to pay attention to what sort of value our current brokerages are, are giving um, for what we're sort of paying and, and what value goes along with that. Now, that being said, um, they are still the fourth largest. There are still huge franchises out there that are crushing it in volume using the old models and the old, you know, the same support and so on. But you can see where some of these differences and how they've been able to stand out uh, or change some things have really made a difference. Now, the next one is that they really allured to a lot of independent brokerages team structure and, and the sort of brokered by option. So there are a lot of brokers out there who can keep their own branding entirely um, as an independent and just include a brokered by EXP 
uh, where states require that information go in. So a lot of people who otherwise would freak out or worry about, oh my God, I have to change my entire brand across the board, um, are, don't necessarily have to do that. So, I, uh, you know, it's a, it's an interesting switch. Um, and you wonder how much, cause, you know, for some brokerages, you want that brand, right? Having some of these brands is why you stand out in your area or why you, you know, some of that. So it's just something to, to sort of pay attention to. Um, and then the revenue sharing and equity program. Um, again, something they sort of are doing a little bit differently, have changed up a little bit. Uh, and last but not least is technology, sorta. So some of their tech stuff is very cool. They've adapted it and built it over the years. Um, it's nothing incredibly revolutionary. Uh, they adapted much of it from an old video game called Second Life, um, which was open source for a little while and then has been spun off and improved and all that sort of stuff. But um, what they were able to do is because they focus on technology as opposed to uh, spending money on some of the operating costs, they are able to split some of those operating costs with their agents when it comes to revenue sharing options, stock sharing options, um, all of those sorts of things. So as an agent, I wouldn't, I'm not saying, hey, go drop and join EXP, but be very realistic about all the different pieces of value um, that your various franchises bring to you. And I mention that because I'm not talking just about EXP. Um, Realogy has also been making some huge waves uh, over the recent years. They've changed their management structure um, at the top entirely, and they've been making some really, really big changes as well. And I wouldn't be surprised to see them make some more changes um, to compete against some of these EXP type groups uh, that are either flat fee or that are drawing agents in another way, right? That they're drawing some sort of um, uh, agent interest in another way from them. So between 2012 and 2019, uh, Realogy had some struggles. Their uh, EBITDA, which is the earnings before interest, taxes, uh, depreciation, and amortization, um, that had a huge drop. So overall business numbers were not looking too great. They brought in some new folks, um, some high execs at Capital One, some folks from the hotel industry, some folks from all over. And um, these are Ryan Schneider, John Payton, and Ryan Gorman. Uh, Ryan Gorman is in real estate within Cardis. Um, but they bring these folks in, bring them, put them in high positions within Realogy, and they start making some significant differences. Now, they're doing some stuff I think is really interesting where they're using their size and data as an advantage, um, which is, is finally great. I mean, they've, they're in all the markets. They might as well use that data to their advantage. So that's very cool to see. They're uh, reorganizing some of the management structure um, to streamline some of the operations. You found that, and I said this for years, and I get it, they sort of compete against each other, right? All of these different franchises that sit within Realogy all compete with one another at some level, um, but they were totally siloed to the extent that they weren't really benefiting from being under the same roof. Uh, and my, I mean, one of my favorite quotes of, of all time is, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. And I think they're starting to understand that message um, within the Realogy ranks and really starting to bring that back. They've started refreshing a whole bunch of the technology across the brand, um, and they are focusing on a one-stop shop. So they're including a lot of ancillary services like Title and Escrow and all of those sorts of things. This has been a big trend, and this might seem like a brokerage trend at face value, but like any brokerage trend, this has huge impacts on how agents are working in their everyday lives for the year going forward. So if you are at one of these brands or you're thinking about moving to one of these brands, definitely pay attention to what they're doing um, to compete and improve for their agents and be realistic about 
the value of the money that you are giving out to those brands um, when we're talking about what they provide for you. Because they all provide something different. You know, they're similar, but everybody has a different package. Um, some are different, right, for different markets. And it, it's really, really about understanding as all of these groups start adapting and changing and growing, making sure that that fits um, for you as an agent, as well as um, how you can compete against some of these groups as they're starting to make those changes and make those adaptations. Now, that brings us to, we talked a lot so far about uh, brokerages providing value. And that I want brings me to our next point, our next trend. Um, which was a topic that was covered um, in the in the Swanable report as a chapter, and that is the lead generation model, the lead generation model. And this one kind of blew me away because when you think about it from a brokerage standpoint, you're like, oh, okay, it makes sense, thank you, great, you know, so on. Um, but then you think about it from an agent side, and you go, wait a second, there is an entire chapter of the Swanepoel Report dedicated to sharing how brokerages can get larger splits from their agents by generating leads for them. That if brokerages are willing to take over uh, generating cold leads, um, generating traffic, all that sort of stuff for their agents, that they can get a higher split where instead of, you know, 80-20 going to the agent, 80-20 is going to the brokerage. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Um, now, they've paid attention to some of the some of the trends, so I get that. And some of the trends are that cold leads have grown as a percentage of total yearly sales. But keep in mind that this is during a time where the internet has grown nearly exponentially. Leads, cold leads within that sector have grown alongside of it, not exponentially or anywhere close to it, but have grown simply because a whole new market of cold leads has been growing and people are continually diving into that market and attempting it more and more and more. That doesn't necessarily mean that more and more people are less interested um, in working with an agent or so on. And the other thing we know is that cold lead and advertising costs are continuing to go up and can actually start be going up to the point where they are prohibitive to individual agents, both from a time-consuming standpoint as well as an individual agent um, having to put in the money, the, just the raw amount of money to stand out in a place like a Facebook or buy an entire zip code from Zillow in certain places or things like that. Those can be cost prohibitive for a lot of agents. So it's interesting to me that, that they're talking to brokerages saying, hey, you can go generate leads for your agents and you can demand 60%, 70%, 80% of their commission. But we also look at data this year from NAR. And NAR tells us that 66% of their sellers found their agent because they knew them or were referred to them. So we're, everybody's going toward the bottom. I mean, it's amazing that they're saying, hey, you can make more money off of worse leads that cost more. I'm like, wait a minute. I get that brokerages can make more money on, and they're talking 20, 30% extra profit um, for the brokerage on uh, essentially managing and selling cold leads. But I think as an industry, and, and not that Swanepoel or the Trends Report or anything like that, not that they miss it, but I think as an industry, we miss the notion that we don't need to be farming cold leads. Like it's, um, it's really interesting to start thinking about that we don't necessarily have to worry about farming cold leads. And, and so we'll take it. Pause for a second here and just think about what it takes for the brokerage, because I, I at least want to give some credit. It's not like they're doing nothing for this. Um, they are, you know, increasing their expenses and management of leads. They've got to be very, very tight, close in on managing them. Um, but then they're charging anywhere up to 80% and a 20, 20 to 30% profit for all of this extra management 
and lead trafficking and all of that sort of stuff that goes on. But as I mentioned, I just, I feel like as an industry, we miss that you can generate a six figure income without having to convert one cold lead. You don't have to. I talk to agents every week, literally every week, who they generate 100% of their business from referrals, from past clients, from people sending them business. So from an agent standpoint, I want you to pay very, very close attention to, um, again, what value you're getting provided for your money in a big picture sense. If you're in a position where you really need cold leads, if that's the kind of lead that you like working and that's what you're all about, um, more power to you. But I want to be very clear that you shouldn't forget where your business comes from because um, some of this is just that brokerages are trying to make more money on leads or lead sources have grown a little bit. Um, but we, we really, we can't lose sight of where at this point, a majority of business comes from in this industry, because at the end of the day, it's better for us to be a concierge, a consultant, someone that has a relationship with the people that we're working with, as opposed to, it, it adds to the professionalism of the industry when we're working with people that know, like, and trust us and really trust what we're doing as opposed to a cold internet lead and you get a phone call and it's like, oh, okay, well, I've talked to you for two minutes. Hey, go show me a house. It's, it's, a, it's a different uh, experience for the consumer and I want to make sure that we're not focusing on the wrong things, okay? Now, Last but not least, um, we're going to cover the post-pandemic, quote-unquote, new normal. And as I said, this was the title of the chapter. So I took this directly. So do what you will with the words new normal and post-pandemic and whatever everybody's making of all of these. Uh, God, there's so much conflict. Um, but I at least wanted to cover some of the things that I, as well as uh, the Trends Report, talked about changing what's going to stay and what's going to kind of fade out or at least not quite have the adoption rate um, that it did or has in, in the previous months. So first of all, let's mention that the real estate market was affected in the short term. Um, the first three to four months, three-ish, people were, were down. Uh, sales volume was down, um, all that. Prices were still up everywhere. Um, volume was down in general. So there's definitely a bit of a lag period when the pandemic and everything hit and it took some time for people to adjust. So the yearly stats are probably going to be a little different than what we see. We're going to see some hiccups in that. But quarter three and quarter four was an incredible rebound and some of the strongest uh, seller market that we've seen in a long, long time. Prices keep going up. We talked about it early on today. So on the whole, brokerages, agents, associations, everybody involved did a pretty solid job doing what we can. And I shouldn't just say just solid. You did a great job doing what we can to adapt to what was a tricky situation um, with a lot of challenges that were posed to a lot of people. And the fact that the market rebounded and did as well as it did in quarter three and quarter four, I think is a testament to the resilience and adaptation of the industry. So give yourselves a pat on the back for that, for sure. Now, beyond that, um, I do want to mention that there are some things that are, have changed a bit and I think are going to continue changing or continue uh, adapting, I think we've seen, but over the next six months to a year, um, as things return and, uh, you know, states start opening back up and things like that happen, um, we're going to see some of these, these adaptations and these things change. Now, first, a lot of folks were transitioned to work remote. Um, and that is both in the real estate industry as well as other sectors. So this plays an important factor. Uh, not just in how we go about our everyday lives, but also the types of homes that we are selling. Um, people are paying attention to, you know, do they have a, an office space or an extra room that they can use? Uh, do they have good internet? Um, is it loud in the area that they're moving into? Um, all of those sorts of things are really starting to play into 
uh, how people are moving and how people are changing where they live. So we definitely want to pay attention to that. But I want to also mention that, and we've really got to pay attention and remind ourselves that not everybody was transitioned remote. Um, there were a lot of people that were laid off, not just in the real estate industry, all over. Now, in the real estate industry, this is something the report does a pretty good job of covering, but a bunch of different organizations, franchises, so on, brokerages, so on, laid off staff, um, some of which I think it was Compass let go of actual agents. Um, some of the, the fewer producing agents were just let go. A ton of groups let go of some of their staff members um, and a lot of the execs took either partial pay cuts for a short period of time or things of that nature to get through um, to get through what they needed to and, and make sure that these companies survived. So keep in mind that uh, we are rebounding not just from people working remotely, we are rebounding from a number of people who have lost their jobs and we're doing it in a sense where the we don't quite have the same staff support on the whole um, that we did. You know, if there's just fewer hours to go around, uh, we, we as an industry don't quite have that same level of staff support that was there prior. So keep, keep that in mind and pay attention to that as you go about your planning um, and, you know, what you're, you're providing to your clients and the, the expectations that you're putting out there. So some of those staff are going to be returning back. And I hope we see that um, as much as we can in the coming months. But a number of them I don't think will. Uh, and we just need to be prepared for that and pay attention to that um, because it's going to have an impact not only in how we manage our days, um, but how the industry uh, starts changing as people are not able to either make rent or mortgage, you know, make their mortgages or things like that for some of these folks that have been, um, you know, either laid off or let go or all of those sorts of things, uh, we are going to start seeing some shifts this year uh, as some of those things start coming due. With that being said, um, within the industry, this is also going to cause some of our physical offices are going to change uh, capacity and direction, meaning um, people still on the whole, management, uh, teams, etc., still on the whole want to meet. They want to get together. People want to work together and collaborate together. Um, but I think, and it's funny because this is something where we're forced to adapt this year, but I've seen uh, brokerages start doing this years ago. In fact, oh God, this is probably six or seven years ago. A good friend of mine, Annette Gregorio, invited me down to her Remax office that had just totally changed their workspace. And instead of being individual cubicles for everybody to come in and do their work, they made it much more of a meeting space, a collaborative space, uh, video room, you know, green space, green room, um, video room to do recordings. Uh, all of that sort of stuff got built into this office and it changed direction. That's, I think, more what we're going to see, that they might, offices might downsize a little bit. Um, offices might change a little bit in terms of how people are collaborating, how people are working together. Um, and what the office spaces are used for, but I don't think we're going to see office spaces just disappear entirely um, into the ether. I don't think we're going to totally go remote. I think at some level, people really do like that interaction. I mean, we are social beings. We really are. And I think people like that interaction um, and that collaborative space. And we're hearing that from a lot of the brokerages out there. And uh, the next piece is in terms of what changing is that video meetings are going to remain popular, but not nearly at some of the mid pandemic levels. All, in fact, there are some stats about this already of uh, Zoom accounts and Zoom numbers and so on trailing off in, in recent months, not back to levels they were, but certainly, you know, everyone's not on Zoom constantly all day long as much at this point. Now, that being said, I think because of the adoption, uh, some folks are going to, I think people now it opens up to folks who will um, be able to do meetings in a place where they might have otherwise had a quick in-person meeting, 
but video will suffice for a lot of this stuff. Covering some quick things or just having a quick phone call might turn into a video meeting, um, but I don't think it's going to replace everything entirely. Um, it certainly is not replacing um, actually going to a home or actually going to a closing table. There are people who still really want that. Even in pandemic levels, there are people who still really want that. So we've seen a real growth in things like virtual shopping, virtual closings, um, but there are a lot of people out there that are still, that's not their, that's not their jam. Um, so we're, I think we're going to see a return to some in-person stuff, but definitely a growth uh, in some of the video. And then some of the uh, suburban relocation will continue um, as remote picks up and becomes more widely adopted, but is not necessarily, uh, again, going to be quite mid pandemic levels of people leaving cities or, or things like that. We will, I think, see some people who are more willing to have a longer commute because they're going into the office fewer days out of a week. Um, there might be things of that nature. So just keep in mind that um, those things are starting to change and adapting as an agent to help them is absolutely critical. Now, there's one more topic. I mentioned that there are real, really four trends that stood out. But there was one more topic as a chapter um, within the Swanepoel Trends Report that I at least wanted to cover. Although I was talking with my friend uh, Paula Montofer, who teaches a ton of fair housing courses, and she's really passionate about this topic, as I am. And she mentioned earlier today, we both aren't necessarily sure this is a trend per se. I know it's made media um, a lot this year, but... Um, there was a topic inside of the trends report that was managing diversity and inclusion. And I don't want to um, do a disservice to this topic and try to add it as an end on uh, to a presentation about trends. If it is a trend, it's certainly something that needs to stick around. Um, and, you know, we need to continue growing and improving in diversity and inclusion in what we're doing. So I think the best thing that I can do for everybody today um, within this topic uh, is not go into depth talking about it, but actually just give you some resources to research this topic. Um, so if you haven't already, these are some really, really incredible resources that you can go use to improve what you're already doing. Uh, first is NAR Fair Housing Simulation. I included the link there. Um, definitely check that out. It's a, a cool online uh, piece that you can go through and work through a simulation and scenarios within fair housing. Um, NAR has an implicit bias training uh, that is available to members, so I would definitely check that out. Um, there is a Facebook group uh, called Deliberate Fair Housing. Um, so if you're looking for more resources, that's definitely another place uh, to go and ask questions and see, you know, what's there um, and what's available. If you're on Clubhouse at this point, uh, there is, um, I believe it's on Mondays, uh, a group that does Real Talk, uh, Race and Real Estate, um, which is a, a really, you know, great. I have not checked that one out yet. I'm going to, um, but I've heard incredible things from friends of mine. And then there are a bunch of free university courses out there that I've gotten uh, grant money and um, different money out there that, that you can often get free courses on inclusion in the workplace uh, if you're so interested and check out some of the universities in your area. So I hope you use a number of those resources um, to do research and check those things out if you haven't already. Uh, and I implore you, please um, take some time if you haven't gone through some of these things or all of these things. Um, please, please do so because I think that's that's the best thing that we can do with our time today. All right. So last but not least, let me close up here um, because it's time to adapt and I know you can. Um, Stephen Hawking has said the uh, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. And I know you are incredibly intelligent people who are capable of amazing things. I mentioned it before, um, your ability to adapt to quarter three and quarter four and rebound and get uh, practices in place and things in place to continue on with your businesses. Uh, there's nothing short of incredible. So I know you're intelligent people. I know you can adapt. 
Um, and I hope that you take some of the trends that we've talked about today and use them to adapt your business. So let me ask, are there any questions? Um, that being said, or let me know in chat, what was one trend that you are going to take away and use today? What is some, what is one little nugget or piece of information that got you to think today? Um, about this topic or, or possibly change something or how you address something in your business. I'd love to hear that in chat. Um, awesome. 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 All right. I think that's it. Uh, thank you to everyone today. Um, I greatly appreciate your time. My name is Alex Camilio, CEO of the Agent Inner Circle with agentinnercircle.com. I'm going to leave this open for just another few minutes here uh, for any questions or uh, items in chat. Um, I would love to love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Africa Henley, awesome. Carol Pyfrom, awesome. I hope I didn't mess your names up. All right. I see a number of people uh, requesting to join the Agent Inner Circle group. Uh, I'm going to go get to those and start approving folks. Thank you to everybody who joined over there. We greatly appreciate it. All right. All right. Well, it looks like we're closing down here again. Thank you to everybody for your time today. I hope this information has been helpful to everybody. My name is Alex Camilio, CEO of the Agent Inner Circle with agentinnercircle.com. I am signing out.